The Babylon Project podcast was our last best hope for reruns. It failed. But in the year of the Shadow War, it became something greater. Our last best hope for fandom. The year is 2017. The Place, the Babylon Project Podcast. This is Maggie Egan, your ISN news anchor, and you're listening to the Babylon Project podcast. Thanks for listening. Hello there, Babylon Pi fans. Welcome to the Babylon Project podcast. This is Raul Wybera, and I am with my good friend Jim Arrowwood, as always. How are you tonight, my friend? Oh, I am great. Great things here in central Nebraska. Great things in central Nebraska? Oh, yeah. Wheat, corn, yeah, Comic Con, <laughs> yeah. Just got back from <laughs> just got back from O Comic Con. Uh, collected some really neat autographs. I got Jack O'Halloran. Ooh, uh, he was non in Superman and Superman Two uh-huh. in the late seventies and and early eighties. I got Ray Park. Ooh, yes, we all know Ray Park as Darth Maul. And mm-hmm. and I got Allison Arngrim. That I, I I'm having a brain fart. Cue the crickets. <laughs> a certain little blonde tornado from uh, Little House on the Prairie, known as Nellie Olson. Oh. <laughs> okay, she. I I knew I I had, I knew I had heard that name somewhere. Yeah, I got autographs from all three of them. So. Oh, wait, what was she doing at a Comic Con? Uh, good question. I uh, that that's one I never could figure out. There were several others. There was the little kid from uh, Jerry Maguire was there, and he hasn't done any sci-fi as far as I know. And the Blue Power Ranger was there, and there were various other personalities that I didn't know who they were, so I didn't get their autographs. Hmm. So it, okay. it was a fun con. I walked around in my Klingon outfit for several hours, met lots of people, and got interviewed by a radio station. <laughs> Jim Mod into cosplay. <laughs> <laughs> do we have a uh, do we do we have a picture of you doing cosplay? Yeah, I'll have that put up one of these days on my blog. Oh, oh, oh! Which is of course uh, Jim Sci-Fi dot Blogspot dot com. Well. What episode are we talking about tonight? Well, we are looking at the third season, number six episode, called Dust to Dust. And this is a psychop, psychor episode, right? Uh, yes, it's it's heavy with Bester. Yeah, everyone's favorite bad guy. <laughs> yes. Except Dizzy a bad guy, which is... Well, you know, in this one, he isn't quite so bad. He actually helps out, uh, and then at the very end, he's a bad guy. But uh, but even there, you know, th- this is one of the things. You, you keep seeing these pieces over and over that keep making you sympathetic towards Bester. Yeah. And I, I, he's, I think he's sincere in his love and support, uh, you know, towards Earth. However, there is going to be an episode in season five that, really ought to knock your knees out from under you if 
if you really are a normal and sympathetic toward the guy. <laughs> um, well, we shall see. We shall see. I, th- I think I, I think a good way of starting to get some context around this would probably be if you gave us your summary. All right, here it is. Archive. Access. Initiated. Psychop Alfred Bester returns to Babylon 5 to track down someone who is trafficking a dangerous addictive drug called dust. Sheridan and Ivanova worries that Bester will scan them and the rest of the command staff and learn all of their secrets. Ivanova's plan to deal with this is to blow Bester's ship out of the sky before he can reach the station, but she is stopped by Sheridan who has a less drastic solution. The command staff is joined by several Minbari telepaths who monitor Bester to make sure he is not scanning until he agrees to have his power suppressed by a drug that Franklin administers. With that being done, Bester explains that dust can temporarily allow non-telepaths to become telepathic and that he is concerned that the drug is to be sold to a representative of an alien race to be used against their enemies as a weapon. After Franklin reports an upsurge of dust use on the station, Bester and Garibaldi investigate. As they interrogate a suspect that seems to know about any and all criminal activity on the station, Bester, who is without his telepathic powers, manages to bluff information out of the suspect. Bester and Garibaldi stake out a cargo bay and apprehend the dust dealer and his henchmen. Bester is forced to leave the station before the telepathy-suppressing drug wears off, where he is met by another psychop. As they leave, Bester tells his companion that he is relieved to have the psychor invention, the dust, out of alien hands. Jakar, who is the actual customer who was supposed to receive the dust shipment, meets with the trafficker and receives a sample. When he takes it, he goes berserk and heads off looking for Londo. After subduing Veer, Jakar uses his temporary telepathic powers to probe Londo's mind, learning all of his secrets, including his association with the shadows and that his appointment to be the ambassador of Babylon 5 was actually a joke. Suddenly, Jakar's own father appears to him and he also sees a vision of Jaquan who tells them that he has to change how he is doing things. However, Jakar doesn't notice that Kosh is standing behind him the entire time he is having these visions. Later, an ombuds sentences Jakar to 60 days in lockup for his assault on Veer and Londo. Veer returns to the station for a brief visit from Minbar. He presents a report on his observations to Londo, who suggests that he makes changes to tell how the Minbari are an inferior race of mindless religious zealots that might pose a threat to the Centauri Republic. Well, there it is. Character files opened. There it definitely is. (laughs) All right. Should we go on to, to the guest cast for this one? Ah, uh, yes, we definitely should. Okay. Who who do we have here? Well, of course, we have uh, Walter Koenig uh, appearing once again as Mr. Bester. He's hard to count as guest cast, though, in some ways. Well, yeah. He, he, he makes his presence very prominent during he, his appearance. He's only in, what, two or three... You know, maybe two episodes, three episodes in any one season. Uh huh. Yet he permeates the mythology. Oh yeah, yeah. And and he's always his his presence is felt often when he's not even in, as part as part of the cast. Mm-hmm. So we also had Julian Neal as Mister Lindstrom. Uh, his only appearance on Babylon Five, and he is also a producer and a writer. When you look at his, his credits, that actually seems to be more than anything his main gig. Yeah, that's his main his thing. Production He's side, producing and writing, and mm-hmm. uh, we get a return a return from Jim Norton as the Narn image, 
Uh, this is his fourth and final appearance on Babylon 5, and we've discussed his other credits before. Right, I think the most recent we saw him was as uh, the doctor, uh, the macabre doctor. Yes, yeah, the Markab, right. the Markab doctor. Markab. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, now, uh, under featuring, there's a few notables here. S. Mark Jordan as the shop owner. Uh, we'll discuss him, I'm sure. Uh, he's uh, got credits on one episode of the A-Team. Uh, voice on Transformers television series as the character known as Onslaught. And uh, also did some voice work on Avatar The Last Airbender. By the way, if you have not watched it, that was a fantastic uh, cartoon series. Oh, okay. It, it, it is... De- the movie... The live action movie mm-hmm. was garbage, but the cartoon series I highly, highly recommend. I wasn't nearly as fond as the of the follow up cartoon, mm-hmm. uh, Legend of Korra, but Avatar was incredible. Okay, now as far as the movie's concerned, and and you referring to it as garbage, I, you know, I. Um... I don't know. I watched it, and I wouldn't classify it as garbage. It was, it was okay. I mean, it it had a trope that was that's been overused for years and years. But I I thought the the effects and the way that they they had oh, things moving the through it. The effects were incredible. But yeah. So it was it was worth seeing just for that reason. Who who was the who was the director? Um, M. Night Shy- yeah, Shyamalan. Oh, M. Night Shyamalan. Shyamalan, yeah. Or also, as he's known, M. M. Night Shyamalama Ding Dong. <laughs> <laughs> he destroyed the story, and frankly, when you see some of the interviews, it was almost it was you, you can almost accuse it of being intentional. Okay, that one I've never seen before, oh, so I, it, I don't it know was, anything about it. It was horrid. Ah. Um, the, the the plot holes, the writing was weak. It's got a 20 meta score from Metacritic. Oh. <laughs> IMDB gives it 4.2 star. Anyway. Yeah, let's move we're, on. We're, yep, we, we are not the Avatar podcast. <laughs> oh, you stole my line. All right, Judy... <laughs> Le- Judy... <laughs> Judy Levitt appears as a psychop. Mm-hmm. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, she is Walter Koenig's wife, and uh, she's also pe- she also appeared on a Babylon Five episode, "A Race Through Dark Places," uh, the eighth episode of the second season. Right. Okay, and then her appearance here. I got a note. Her appearance here is significant. It makes a tight connection between Bester and some of the black ops science that's going on by the Psychor. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it had been suspected and stuff first, because you remember, she was the one dealing with some of the programming, that Section 13 stuff. Mm-hmm. So there, there's a yeah. direct connection between Bester and that uh, chicanery. Mm. And uh, we have Philip Moon as Ashi, uh, this is his only appearance on Babylon 5, and he was also in Batman Forever. This is one busy guy. Yeah. And then uh, Danny Thompson played the Ombuds. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is her only appearance on Babylon 5. Right. Um, and I've got to add in one other person, uh, Kim Strauss, who played uh, the Drazi Ambassador. He, he's one of our favorite, at least one of the fan, he's a fan favorite. Ah, he shows up a fair number of times in Babylon 5 uh, in a variety of roles, but primarily as the Drazi ambassador. Okay. And he's another very, very busy uh, gentleman. Huh. Whether it is doing Power Rangers or Transformer voice acting or, you know, things like Babylon 5, um, it's... Or soap operas. He, he is very, very, very busy. <laughs> and he was a lot of fun. When you see that Drazi ambassador throughout, 
it's a good chance it's, you know, if you see someone in a drowsy costume that sticks out, it's a good chance it's him. Initiating plot analysis. All right. We get a very disturbing opening. Oh, uh, yeah. If you're a student of history, uh, Night Watch is definitely getting nasty. Yes, 1939 Germany. Yep, down to the uh, references to the Bund meeting and referring to the security guard as Momser. <laughs> yeah. Uh, folks are a little upset. Oh, yeah. They're, they're very angry because, well, the shop owner put up a sign accusing Clark of being a criminal after the evidence that he was complicit in uh, mm -hmm. President Santiago's death that he should be removed from office and jailed. And right. the Night Watch, the Night Watch brown shirt, <laughs> you know, I hate to say that, but... It's the best way to describe it. That That's the way he was acting. You know, the opinion, this, this man's opinion, the shop owner's opinion, is uh, not only unpopular, but it is against the rules. Mm-hmm. Or at least the unofficial rules. Uh, th th those unofficial rules seem to be creeping in a sense. Uh, last episode when Garibaldi and Zach were having some issues. Yeah. Well, and, you know, the Night Watch is gaining their confidence. They've been mobilized now and have been given their instructions that not only are they to police seditious activities, but they are also to be the thought cops and make sure that everybody is thinking right. You went right down what I was talking about, the thought police. Remember last week we were talking about what political correctness means in a historical context. Right, and, and what a political officer does. Well, the political officer is not present, but... Those powers have been delegated. She's obviously had an influence on, on the security people that are part of this Night Watch thing. Mm -hmm. I will say this, I think Sheridan was rather gentle with that guard because even where Night Watch is at this point, uh, Sheridan would have been absolutely justified in having that guy tossed into the brig. If, if Sheridan had done that, I think that he would have eventually been tossed in the brig himself. I think he knew this, and so... Uh, he went. He went easy and took the easy way and the least confrontational way out of this that he could possibly get, for many reasons. In order to not create a scene, in order to keep himself where he needs to be, because him defending that shop owner would have made him also uh, treasonous in their eyes. Well, he did certainly defend that shop owner. Yes. And that would not have that would not have gone down well. Right, and we are going to be shortly seeing some of the repercussions of things like this. Yes, it, it's not that far away. However, I would say right now this bit with the night watch is the least of the problems, because Esther is calling. Everybody's favorite psychop, Alfred yep. Bester, is calling in, and I'm going to be there in seven hours. Yippee ki yay. Yeah, oh joy, everybody's really happy about this, right? And as always, someone is a danger to the station. Yeah, and they point that out. Every time Pester shows up, we're go we've are we got a problem on the station, but this time, as we're going to see, it may be legitimate. I think, we're, yeah, uh, though uh, we may have a good discussion of what constitutes legit by the time we're done. <laughs> well, yeah, you know... Uh, the truth is a three-edged sword, as we well know. Correct. <laughs> and the mountain is falling. The mountain is falling. Yes, make it stop. Make it stop. That guy is going nuts. How does that relate to this story? Well, <laughs> well, it, that it comes up after he gets uh, brought into med lab. Right. right. And let's see. This is is this all before the opening credits roll? Um, I believe so. Yeah, that's a lot of setup in a little time. Oh, I get it. The, oh, hey, hang on a minute. The mountain is falling on me. The pebbles have voted. 
<laughs> yeah, that is a bit prophetic there, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Whether whether by intent or not, uh, with where we are in the story, it's, yeah, it, in fact, that segues us very nicely because Sheridan has the Council of Light together to talk about the Bester problem. And the uh, prob- what is, just exactly what is the problem with Bester coming on board? Well, he is a telepath. Ah, they do have a lot of things that they don't want to talk about. <laughs> yeah. The least of which is Susan's great desire to wound him just a well, little. I, actually, at first, both her and Garibaldi suggest just outright killing him. Yeah, blow up a ship. Yeah. And uh, uh, Franklin's not going to be a party to that. No, though I think Franklin's going to have to eventually. Well, he's a doctor, so I get that to begin with. Yeah. Well, that and Sheridan knows that that's going to call undue attention to the station also. Right. So we, we you know, we're, we're using logic here. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and so they just, you know, well, maybe we can wound him just a little. Well, Dylan <laughs> does have a solution, though, that, that yeah. doesn't involve any wounding. Yeah. Or boom. <laughs> she, she's got a solution. Yes, which we will find out about in just mm-hmm. a little bit. Londo uh, greets Veer as he returns from his short time there on uh, Minbar. Yeah, Veer seems to be going native. <laughs> yeah, he's wearing he's wearing a an outfit that is that that was given to him by the Minbari, and uh, Londo doesn't really approve of this. Well, we're going to find out. Londo's got his own ideas about. How to be an ambassador. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they will prove most interesting. Uh, we do find out a few things uh, fairly quickly here. Uh, first of all, the warrior cast is not too friendly. Well, duh. Yeah. They don't like foreigners. <laughs> no. Uh, we, we, we've kind of gotten that impression already. Uh, their opinion of Londo, I, I think, is interesting. They only speak of him behind closed doors. <laughs> yeah. It looks like uh, Veer's picking up some delicacy in his speaking, at least. Oh, yeah. He's being treated very well on Minbar, and uh, he likes it there. Right. And so, you know, he's a little more relaxed, I would imagine, than he is running around after Londo all the time. Yeah. Uh, Veer is doing well. I think Membar is being good for him. Mm-hmm. I think another way of putting it is being on Membar is allowing Veer to be himself. Yeah, there we go. That's good. That's a good way to put it. And I think we'll see more of that as we go along a bit. Uh, to the main story. And yes, this is going back to the guy who was having his delusions of mountains. It yeah. seems that there was a geological consultant down the hall from the crazy dude who was in an avalanche. Mm. So, yeah, they have him check the guy for dust. Yeah, so the yeah, the pebbles did vote. Yep. Yep. <laughs> now, you know, we we've kind of heard of dust before in I think all the way back into season 1 at one point, wasn't it? We've heard it just mentioned. Yeah, really I'm trying don't know trying what to remember. it is. Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember, but I don't. Uh, it must have been just a passing remark or something. It was, it was, and I think it might have been in context with the Raiders. Oh, okay. And I think it may have been mentioned another time as far as stuff being brought, you know, just drug running being brought on board uh, at, you know, entry points. Mm-hmm. I, I So I it, it's only been mentioned very much in passing, so... We we don't really know what it does yet. We do know it has Franklin stress, though. <laughs> well, you know, symptoms, finding symptoms of dust and Bester on board will do that to a person. <laughs> yep, yep. That that that's certainly the case. And heck, Bester isn't even on board yet. Yeah, and let's not forget that Franklin is abusing stims mm-hmm. at this point, even though it's not even though it's not brought out in this episode. We right. know that has been happening. Right. I'm not sure in this case it's that just everything that's crashing down. I'd be a little snappy. <laughs> uh, 
Bester's let's, let's clarify there. Bester is not on board the station yet. No, that's He's that's right. There, and so Bester's arrival and the yep. symptoms of dust appearing will do that. Okay, I <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> um, I, I I think Susan missed the message on how to handle Bester though because. She clears the command deck and is just about ready to blow him out of the sky. Well, in fact, she even gives the fire command, and Sheridan arrives just in time to belay that order. Well, before she gives that firing command, she has a little discussion with herself, and right. she explains they they just don't understand what Bester represents, and she does know what Bester represents, mm -hmm. and she ju that's how she justifies getting ready to light him up yeah and <laughs> did did you notice though the that mm -hmm. the hatch in uh command and control did not close after everybody left you know i do believe you're right i don't think that was an accident though no it did not close uh so that um sheridan could come on to the command center without triggering susan to let her know that he was coming on, uh, coming on deck. I, I, I think, yeah. And obviously, since his proximity triggered, in fact, you know, I didn't realize it was close, but I do know you, you see, if you look carefully, you can see some evidence of someone hovering in the background there. Yeah. And I, I've never, I've noticed that in the past, and I've never taken it as a mistake you know, or a continuity error. Yeah. I, I've always kind of taken it as Sheridan waiting to see what Susan's really going to do. Well, that would be one way to interpret it. You know, but this to me is kind of a plot hole um, because Susan is willing to throw her entire life away, her career, everything, mm -hmm. to blow Bester out of the stars. And he's just not worth it. No. I agree with that. I, I would call it almost, I, I would almost call it more weak development than anything. Okay. Well, to, to me, it's kind of a, it's it, a bit it's, of a plot hole. It's not very Susan-like. It's not very susan -like. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what, that's kind of what I mean. She's usually very logical in her thinking and she thinks ahead, but at, the, at this point she's not thinking ahead either. Either her passion against Psychor has has overwhelmed her, or they just weren't thinking when they wrote this. Well, that's how they would justify your criticism. Yeah. But I, I, I agree with you. I find that justification very weak for Susan. Mm -hmm. I, I, I could possibly see another character taking a, an approach like that. Uh Jakar or Lando wouldn't hesitate to blow someone out of the sky who has a threat like that. But yeah. you're, you're right. It's not, it is kind of weak for Susan. It allows the fight them without becoming them conversation though. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty much the only purpose of it. Yeah. Well, it does. Okay. It, it has one other purpose. When Bester comes on board, he's a bit rattled. <laughs> the, Susan's emotions were so strong that he was able to pick them up at uh, that distance. Well, let's not forget she's a latent telepath also. Right. Right. So that also tells us that telepathy, at least in some cases, can have a much longer range uh, than we might realize. Maybe not for actual thought, direct thought communication, but for Bester to get a feeling that he's at great personal danger well they've they've mentioned on numerous occasions that strong emotions come through a lot clearer yes but this is a case where we're probably looking at a few kilometers mm -hmm. so speaking of bester delin's solution i love it he walks into a room full of mambari teeps well isn't it nice <laughs> that all these Minbari telepaths just happen to be on the station at just the right moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Earth employs commercial telepaths. Um, they have one 
regularly present on Babylon 5. Mm -hmm. It seems that there's no, you know, Centauri telepaths seem to be conveniently available. Yeah, to do really bad stuff, too. <laughs> well, they are Centauri. Yes. But yeah, what was it, four telepaths? There were four. That was, yeah, my convenient. There are four telepaths. No, no, wrong <laughs> show. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> of course, with a seven-hour window, well, probably five or six, I, I, I'm wondering if Dylan was able to pull a few strings through the Rangers and get them shipped in quickly. Oh, uh, who knows? It, it's just... It's a grope. It, it's cool. It, I can deal with it. <laughs> But the main purpose is that they are there to keep Bester out of their minds because, frankly, they don't trust him. No. Well, who would? Yeah, well, there, well, there's rules about doing unauthorized scans. Telepaths aren't supposed to dig around in people's minds. But let's face it, can you really count on Bester to play by the rules? Uh, no. Bester will justify anything that he feels is necessary to do. we'll get the answer to that to at do. the end of the episode. Yeah, yes. for, as far as advancing his agenda. Uh, the discussion of Talia. Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, the trying to get into Mike's mind uh, with the dissection reference. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You know what? I would not be surprised. Well, as I understand it, that is considered... Yeah, she, she was killed and her brain... Picked apart, mm -hmm. uh, according to JMS, if I remember, like I said, if I remember correctly. Um, besides which, with uh, how they dealt with uh, the sleeper personality, mm -hmm. Talia died with that. Oh, definitely. And she won't be back. Right. You, you course... get the impression that that was more than, quote, death of personality. Right. Well, of course, we knew we shouldn't that she wouldn't be back because she was uh, at after okay. Babylon Five. She was Jag, or was it uh, NYPD Blue? Ooh, I don't know which one she did first. I know there's one or the other, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, it seems four Membari telepath are enough to shut down a psychop. <laughs> so Bester gets an option. Franklin puts him on the sleepers while he's there to suppress his memory or mm -hmm. suppress his suppress his ability yeah or he gets a uh, bony entourage yeah he, he he gets a minbari following him around everywhere with yep. with the with, to, with the staff to protect them and of course uh bester being bester he takes the easy way because he's not too worried about it well and he, when he briefs them on dust, it turns out that, uh, well, no, he, well, that actually is going to come up to be a little later. We actually will find out that he really is there for a legitimate reason. But right here at this point, uh, we get one of my absolute favorite Bester lines. Okay, here uh, it is. I think you might have it. I'm here to save your butts next time. Show a little gratitude. On the other hand, maybe wounding him isn't such a bad idea after all. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it it comes out, the, the way it's just a stop, pause, it's almost like it's a non sequitur. Oh yeah, and then the way the way Walter Koenig delivers that line, he is such a smart <laughs> arse that it it, yeah. it it it's comical as heck. Oh, it, it's great. Ah, we get a little macro universe development in just a moment here, mm -hmm. because Delin is mediating an issue between the Centauri and the Drazi. Yeah, it would seem that uh, the Centauri want a buffer zone. Of nine planets. Seven, I thought. Or seven, seven, nine, something like that, some odd uh -huh. number. And uh, before, they only wanted two, and apparently uh -huh. the Drazi were 
hesitant or delaying action. Well, yeah, and, giving up their sovereign territory. Yeah, and then the Centauri say, okay, well, they're now going to negotiate this, and the Centauri say, well, tell you what, uh, things have changed, so we need more now. Yeah, Czechoslovakia, 1930-what year was that? Oh, I, I couldn't tell you, to be honest. Yeah, All, it, it's very similar, though. Yeah, but it seems that peace with the Centauri is very expensive because Londo lets mm -hmm. them know in no uncertain terms that they can expect to happen to them what happened to the Narn. Yeah, he's just flat out threatening them. And, you know, that is brazen by... Uh, a polite way of putting it. ...by Londo to, to just absolutely... <laughs> Tell them, you know, well, we can do whatever we want. We're the Centauri. Right. Uh, the, the the really brazen part of that is to do it with Membari sitting there. Yeah. Because as advanced as the Centauri might be relative to Earth, they've still got a few millennia to go to catch up with the Membari. Well, and not only that, we know that the Membari and the, and the Vorlons... But well, we know that, though. Have a very interesting relationship. We know that, but how much of that do the other are the other races aware of? Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what. I doubt they know as much, but right. <laughs> at the same Poor time, fear, the, the Minbari are formidable enough. Right, but poor Veer, he's just kind of wilting there. Yeah. Uh, you, you can see how embarrassed he is. Uh, he... Thanks to Lynn at the end after Londo storms out, and he's still got faith in Londo to do what's right. He, Veer, is the eternal optimist. Mm hmm And Lanier takes the other side of that and says that Londo is beyond help. You know what? My position, and the, you know, we'll get into this discussion uh, in a couple seasons. Mm hmm My position is that they are both right. Oh, yeah. They are definitely both right, and it I couldn't agree more. Bester is briefing the command crew, trying to chase down a dust ring. Uh, we find out a little more about dust. Uh, basically, it allows what amounts to telepathic rape, and it is very, very addictive. Uh, normals who are attacked through dust recover. Telepaths don't. Mm-hmm. And Franklin confirms Bester's story. Yes, he does. And uh, we're looking for a big-time dust dealer who is apparently selling it or looking to sell sell it to uh, alien governments. Right. And, gee, Bester points out, uh, do you know of anyone who might be interested? Well, and we all know that the only race that does not have telepaths that really wants them badly is the yep. Narn. Is the Narn. By the way, when, when, when you talk about Bester and Dust together, am I the only one who, who keeps getting these eye-bleach-worthy visions of Jakar in a french maid outfit? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, 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 where's this going? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I have been too I have been way too busy. I've had a lot of outdoor concerts in a very lot high amount of heat, so my brain is fried. Uh, well we can say that Bester's just <laughs> being a dust buster here. <laughs> okay, okay. So let's put the French made costume on Bester instead of Jakar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. But yeah, it turns out the other races are Jakar and he gets a sample. Uh, he wants to use it as a weapon, but the drug runner does not know if it's safe for the Narn. Yeah, it has never been tested on Narn. Mm-hmm. Well, because Narn don't have telepaths, and it activates the latent gene in normals. Yeah. But He's trying... Out. Well, you know, uh, Jakar is, is looking to gain, regain an advantage that everybody else has and he doesn't. So right. now he's he's going to buy the answers instead of instead of ask the questions. Mm -hmm. 
And all Narn telepaths, we find out, just like you said, regain. They were exterminated roughly a thousand years ago. Yeah, we don't get too many details on that yet. No, but what else happened on Narn a thousand years ago? We do know that. Oh, yeah. Well, of course, the uh, shadows were nearby. Which tells us, okay, M Morden is involved with Earth, Gov, and in particular, we know the Psychor already. Mm -hmm. But we've also got now this hint that for some reason, Morden's associates don't particularly like telepaths for some reason. Ah. Uh. We'll get a lot more about that after a hmm. while. Important question to keep in mind. Mm-hmm. So, Bester, on his hunt. We're going to pop back and forth between the two of those for a bit here. Yeah, and and it, it goes pop, pop, pop pretty quick. Yeah. This piece right now, I mean, it's a lot of work between Bester and Garibaldi mm -hmm. uh, on, on the hunt. And I will say this right now. This episode... Because of that, there was a great chemistry between the two. Yeah. And it, it made was, the episode fly. Yeah, speaking of NYPD Blue, it was a it was a classic good cop, bad cop kind of a situation here. Right. You know, and Bester notes he can't even hear the background around him. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really kicked right there, I believe, and what we will see as we learn more about Bester, he really is. He claims he is trying to protect the Earth in his own way. Yeah, that's not to say there isn't something sinister behind that, but... Uh, Correct. Well, of course he is, but, you know, he explains to Michael that he has his job to do, and Michael has his job to do, and, and they're doing it. Uh, Bester gets rather indignant, mm -hmm. and I think he has a right to. Yes. The, the, this is where it's like, okay, you start to get a little sympathy for where Bester's concerned, but you really need to be cautious about it. Oh, yeah. Because in his own way is really the operative words. <laughs> and we'll, we'll find out more about this as the series progresses. Yeah, because his own way is, uh, uh, yeah, not messy. always very pleasant. Uh, speaking of messy, Jakar's room looks like Antonio's room. Yeah, or Chrissy's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's a wreck. Uh, he's gone ahead and tested the drug on himself. Uh-huh. Uh, you notice the black eyes, by the way? Yeah, that that's really disturbing. <laughs> Shadow tech? Mm, I don't know. It's hard to say. I guess it could be. Uh, or something strictly developed by humans. Well, we'll see. Anyway. We find Jakar looking for Lando. He's screaming Malari and storming off. Uh-huh. And, you know, these are some bad side effects, you know. Kind of makes yep. Jakar... You know, actually, the black eyes kind of make me think of Lita when she's being influenced by Kosh. Hmm. Or, or when she's making huge use of her telepathic powers. Yes. Yeah. Because, yeah, when it's influenced by Kosh, or we see it again when she's down on uh, Mars in uh, the next season. Yeah. Well, you know, it could, it could just be a plot device, too. Mm -hmm. Just to let us know that the, the brain is working in mysterious ways. Yep. Well, mysterious ways. Uh, you, you were talking about good cop, bad cop. Yeah. Ashi, the enforcer. Uh the guy who pretty much all the contraband coming in and out of the station runs through is being questioned by Mike. And like your typical crook, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, he's he's being looked at closely by Mike and Bester. Uh, oh, yes, Bester. Who... And of course, Bester's in uniform. He's got the Psychor right. the, the uh, badge. And the gloves on and the uniform, so, you know, obviously Ashi is thinking that he's being examined in more ways than one. Yeah, uh, and the way Bester bluffs him is like, he's lying. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, he's lying. And Mike gets the name out of him. Actually, now it's almost like Bester's being the good cop and Mike's putting the uh, arm twist. Yeah, 
because Baxter says, oh, no, no, sorry, that's off the record. Uh, we, we don't have that on the record. Yeah. Well, Mike uses it to get uh, a name. Mm-hmm. And... So we see, we see that, that Bester has skills beyond his, his powers. Yeah, he, he's got a lot of smarts behind it. He's also an investigator, a professional investigator. So he, you know, he doesn't necessarily have to have his powers all the time. To, uh, well, he's a psy cop, and we yeah. keep focusing on the psy, and this is a good reminder that of the cop side of it. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny, Mike doesn't like his methods, uh, you know, the whole intimidation with his badge and uniform stuff. Yeah. And Bester has, I think, a legitimate response to that. I think he does. Go ahead and play it. I thought the sleepers kept you from scanning anyone. That's right. So how'd you know he was lying? Well, the odds were good that he was lying about something. Liars are always afraid that somebody's going to see through them. So I just provided them with a vehicle for his paranoia. Your captain's opinions notwithstanding, the badge and the uniform do have certain advantages. You like intimidation? Absolutely. Just like... Your badge and your uniform. <laughs> so, you know, those are the tools of a police officer. Yeah. I, I You don't want to say it, but Bester's right in this case. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, you take, we've got a street here in Kearney, 39th is what it's actually called. I, I call it uh, Kearney International Motor Speedway. <laughs> You know, speed limit, 35 miles an hour. Underneath, it says optional on the speed limit sign. Um, uh, People drive like crazy on that road. And, you know, until, of course, they spot one of our local gendarmes, black and whites, coming up the street. And then they turn into little old ladies from Pasadena, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, driving. Well, not from Pasadena, but... (laughs) Driving very, very slowly and very, very <laughs> properly. Little, 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 oh, God. Yeah. So it, it's, uh, you know, the the accoutrements of, of a police officer definitely give them an advantage and allow them to uh, know things that they normally or other people normally wouldn't know. All right. You, you brought up little old ladies. You brought up Pasadena. You brought, brought up driving. You, you, you're asking for it now uh you know there's a there's an old joke i I know troy will get troy will definitely appreciate this one uh chp's on patrol and there's this car going down uh the five that's barely moving that's creeping along at five to ten miles an hour and he pulls her over he pulls the car over because you know it's Obviously, that's if you've ever been, if you've ever driven Southern California, someone driving five miles an hour is a real problem. Mm-hmm. And he looks in, and there's this l- car with some little old ladies. And he asks, is, "Is there something wrong?" And she said, "Well, no." He said, "Well, why are you driving five miles an hour?" But it, I was supposed it was supposed to. That's what the sign said. It's like, "Oh, no, 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 ma'am, ma'am." That sign was the that sign was the freeway you're on. That's the five. <laughs> and she's like, oh, oh, oh. And he looks in the car, and the little uh, the other little old lady next to him is sitting there with her knuckles crunched into the dashboard and her face so white. He he's afraid that she's about to have a heart attack, and. He asks her, ma'am, are you okay? What's wrong? She looks at him and says, we just came off the 101. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. That one's for you, Troy. Yeah. You've probably heard it before. Yeah. Okay. No, we better better keep a move. We've been on quite a while. Yeah, and as long as we're on the humor side of things, Londo is being an editor, helping Veer out with his report. Oh, yeah. You know, you've heard of The Art of War? 
you've heard of the art you've heard of the art of the deal this is the art of bs <laughs> yep and do you have that conversation yeah now i am finished what did you think I, I really want your opinion before i send my report back home do you really think the mimbare can be trusted oh yes why Ah, uh, Veer. I have only seen political naivete this complete once before in a speech before the Centaurum by Lord Jarno. When he was finished, we recommended that he be sterilized in the best interests of evolution. And then we remembered that he was married to Lady Arno. So really, there was no need. Londo, the Mimbari are very lovely people, interested in culture and art and... Decadent and soft probably out to impose their views on everyone else. But their cities are thousands of years old. The lack of new construction is the surest sign of a faltering economy. This could make them very aggressive. They are deeply spiritual people, yes, Lando. That you can leave in. It always scares people. Do, Lando, are, are you deliberately trying to drive me insane? The universe is already mad. Anything else would be redundant. Lando. Get that. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. Yeah. <sighs> so anyway, yeah. Uh, this is a running gag throughout Veer's uh, ambassadorship. Yeah, Londo's coaching him on how to properly write up a report to make sure that the Centauri look better than everybody else. Right. And I think Veer's thinking he's saved when the doorbell rings. Yeah, you hear, but, that, uh, you hear that doorbell go off, boop, 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 just before uh, the end of the clip. Except, hi, Jakar. Yeah, and Jakar has arrived, and he doesn't look happy. He's <laughs> no, 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 no. He's holding, uh, he's holding Veer up with one hand by the neck. <laughs> yeah, and looking at Londo with those black glazed-over eyes, and he just drops uh, Veer and starts advancing. Yeah, I, I I don't think this is going to be a pleasant afternoon for Lando. No, it, it's not going to end well at all. Well, Bester and Garibaldi, they are back on the beat still. Yep, and they're on a they're on a stakeout. Mm-hmm. Waiting for this Morgenstern guy. Mm-hmm. You know they really do make a good team. They do. Uh, and as far as the chemistry is concerned, I know we we've got a lot of clips tonight, but. Just the banter between them is wonderful. Yeah, just uh, do you, do you have do you have any of that at all? Oh yeah, Sharon? just just before they uh, make the arrest. Mm -hmm. We know where he is. We could have just gone and picked him up. There's no go. Yeah, like this is too smart to keep the dust in this place. Fashi's right about the shipment. We can get him and the evidence we need to bust him. You see, there's this little thing called due process. We're kind of funny about it. Anything yet? Negative. If I had my talent working, I could have warned you when he was coming. And if I had a baseball bat, we could hang you from the ceiling and play pinata. I still think I should have gone right to Jakar. We have no evidence that he made the sale yet. Why annoy the Narn without cause or if we're wrong? Shut off the problem at the source and the rest attends to itself. A pinata, huh? So, you think of me as something bright and cheerful, full of toys and candy for young children. Thank you. That makes me feel much better about our relationship. <laughs> so anyway, you know, here is Michael saying we should go directly to Jakar right after he gives uh, <laughs> Bester a lecture on due process. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and, and then Bester reminds him, look, we, we don't have anything on Jakar here. We don't know if the sale's been made or not. Right. You ba basically, they're talking shop. Yeah. And, and they're talking shop effectively, but the digs that they're throwing at each other in the same breath, it, it, it's just, they're, they're, I, I've used this word before in the series, this is, these are other priceless moments. Oh, yeah. But they make their best. Yep. We hear Michael's... Uh, communicator beep 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 three times that's the signal apparently that uh mm -hmm. things are getting ready to go down so it appears bester was right 
Yeah, and Garibaldi too. That they couldn't go. Str- they couldn't go immediately for Morgenstern. Right. Uh, he wouldn't have. He wouldn't have the goods. So, yeah, where they, where they were correcting each other, they both ended up. Yeah. On, on the mark. Like I said, they make a great team. Yeah, they got two cases. If of they this didn't stuff. hate each other's guts. <laughs> so oh, so this now is the be fun in season four. The dust is out of circulation now. The dust is out of circulation. Mm-hmm. However, Jakar is not, <laughs> and Londo is in bad shape. Uh, I mean, he's in bad shape physically, not just mentally. Uh, I mean, mentally, he's in bad shape because Jakar is kind of digging through his mind. Well, you know, some would say that Londo deserved what he got. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't be one of those people. I really honestly feel bad for Londo. I do as well. Seeing him there cowering, pleading, and and as injured as he is, I mean, he was beaten, it looked like, to within an inch of his life. Mm-hmm. I might be something of an eye for an eye kind of guy, uh, as Mike is, but like him, I'm also a strong believer in due process. Uh, yeah, I, I, I feel sorry for... There, there's no excuse for, for that kind of an assault. Yeah, and it, it really... Mental or physical. It really speaks a lot to Peter Jurisic's acting ability to instill those kind of emotions in somebody with mm-hmm. all the nasty stuff as he as he's done. Well, even earlier in the episode, the way he talked to the Drazi. Right, and you notice something. He, he, with that, well, every time we get Jakar... We, Every time we get the two actors on the screen together, it's magic. You've got Jakar sitting there like he's in judgment. Mm-hmm. When, when we're in the black, you know, when we're in the black, not in the actual physical, but when we're in the black uh, back, background, mm-hmm. meaning in, in the chamber, dark recesses of Londo's mind, it's like Jakar is sitting in judgment. <laughs> and... With the way you're describing it, you know, that's a role Jakar is not entitled to. Right. You 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 really do feel pity for Lando, mm-hmm. and even more so as we dig through Lando's secrets. Oh yeah. Well, uh, and the like, big huge one, the big huge secret that comes out here, is that mm-hmm. Lando was appointed to this post. Because he had zero respect within the Centauri governmental system. It was a joke. Yeah. And you know... He was there because no one else wanted it. This explains an awful lot, especially when you think about Londo's behavior up Mm -hmm. to the point where he met Morden. Right. You know, and it also explains his behavior, his, his compassion for Veer. Remember, Veer was sent for the same reason. Yeah. And so why wouldn't Londo be the buffoon we have referred to him before? Because why should he care? Nobody else really Mm -hmm. does. The Centauri government doesn't have any respect for Babylon 5 or its purpose. So they send send someone that they have zero... Zero respect for zero respect or zero faith in just to go fill a position and and be mm-hmm. a presence. So in order for Londo to save face, he of course hooks up with Morden. Right. Kind of sad. Yeah, a dark, very dark path. Yeah. And we see the beginnings of that path now. Yeah, and then we get this uh, rapid fire. Flipping. Everything Lando has done. Oh, and everything that's going to be done. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Jakar sees everything as far as Lando's role in the big picture now. Mm hmm. And then someone says, It is enough. Uh huh. And everything stops. Jakar just kind of wakes up. Looks up and sees his father. Mm hmm. And his father tells him that he needs to avoid the death of both peoples. Mm -hmm. I think this is probably our last clip to play. It it, it is 
so powerful. It speaks for itself in some ways, but we really can't discuss it until we hear it. Right. So go ahead and let that play. It is enough. Who's there? Just us. Who are you? I am who I have always been. Father, it is too late for me, Jika. It is not too late for you. Honor my name. Honor my name. No. We are a dying people, Jakar. So are the Centauri, obsessed with each other's death until death is all we can see, and death is all we deserve. The Centauri started it. And will you continue until there are no more Nans and no more Centauri? If both sides are dead, no one will care which side deserves the blame. It no longer matters who started it, Jakar. It only matters who is suffering. No. No, I have an obligation to honor my father's name. And how have you chosen to honor that name? What is there left for Nan if all of creation falls around us? There is nothing. No hope, no dream, no future, no life. Unless we turn from the cycle of death towards something greater. If we are a dying people, then let us die with honor by helping the others as no one else can. I don't understand. Because you have let them distract you, blind you with hate. You cannot see the battle for what it is. We are fighting to save one another. We must realize we are not alone. We rise and fall together. And some of us must be sacrificed if all are to be saved. Because if we fail in this, then none of us will be saved. And the Nan will be only a memory. You have the opportunity here and now to choose. To become something greater and nobler and more difficult than you have been before. The universe does not offer such chances often, Jakar. Why now? Why not earlier? All this time, where have you been? I have always been here. I have always been here. <laughs> well, you know. Yep. Kai. So, so we I mean, get. Jaquan. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, and yeah, <laughs> and Jakar's father. But you know, I, I, as I watched this, and I thought about it, and it. The question comes in my mind, where is this actually coming from? You know, I think it would have to be coming from within Jakar itself, himself. It's always been there. Only Kosh is on hand to help bring this out and bring Jakar to a turning point. So Kosh's help is influencing Jakar in the same way that he has influenced Sheridan. That makes a very profound sense. Yeah. You know, Jakar has always had this within him. He just never realized it. Mm-hmm. You know, now we see... It's a theological moment. Yeah. Well... And I don't mean that... Or a religious moment. And I don't mean that in the religious church i mean that in the philosophical sense well it's a it's a you know where the phrase is used it's an introspective revelation for jakar right it's his turning point it's where he it's becomes point. it's where he becomes more deeply a more deep hmm, a deeper thinker <laughs> mm-hmm. rather than rather than having the blinders on he's going to now start looking at at all sides of things right right and we're gonna we're, we're gonna see this develop uh, throughout the whole rest of the series oh yeah as a matter of fact it gets sometimes it becomes quite humorous mm-hmm. but at the moment well jakar's on trial mm-hmm. 
And instead of arguing about it, he s- simply pleads guilty. Yeah. E- well, even with Sheridan speaking up for his defense. Yeah. That's, this is part of his change. I mean, if you watch Jakar at the moment that he pleads before the ombuds, He's totally at peace Uh with this. He has, you know, he knows that he has done something wrong, and he is more than happy to admit to it. He's not trying to get out of it. He is not blaming somebody else. I mean, the Jakar before would be, well, it's not my fault. It's their fault because they killed all our telepaths and they attacked our home world Mm -hmm. and they kill all these people and they do this and it's always somebody else. And now Jakar is owning his, his own actions. I believe the phrase I had used to describe Jakar before was a snake. Yeah. And as you put it midway here through season three or in the first third of season three, Mm -hmm. fourth, I guess, uh, there is a very profound turning point. You, you, your phrasing on that is perfect. Well, thank you. I do have one problem, though. Mm-hmm. For a double assault, as you say, beating Londo to what appears to be an inch of his life, for a double assault involvement in drug running and what essentially is a mental rape, Jukar gets 60 days. <laughs> Yeah. Five to life? No. I uh, you know sixty days. Perhaps because on one side of Jakar you had Captain Sheridan, and on the other side of Jakar you had Michael Garibaldi. Perhaps the Ombuds thought maybe leniency was something that she could do because because of who was advocating for him. Oh I this time we're on the opposite side of uh, this plot hole discussion because, especially after after her little speech about culpability and intent, ooh, it, it, that that's uh, it's probably a stretch, but it's probably also as good of an explanation as we'll get. Well, and then. On the practical side, the non-philosophical side of it, is you can't give him five more years because there's only two and... Two and a half left in the show. Three, four seasons left, and you can't have Jakar locked away forever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I like that as Jakar's going into lockup, Mike brings him the Book of Jaquan, and you know that that's something important to Jakar, so give him something to read and Jakar tells Michael to hang on to it that he is closer to the source. Yeah, he he's now in his mind probably thanks to Kosh or what was inside of him. He's he's met Jaquan. He's going to be a much more religious figure from here on out. Oh yeah, he's found out what Jaquan is actually about. Right. And then again, how many how many times has he read this book? He's always known it, but he's uh-huh. just now, maybe because of the dust, he's put it all together. Who knows? Yeah. Now, wrapping everything up, Veer is going back to Membar. Yep. And, uh, well, let, let's uh-huh. hold on just a second. Veer has, has been uh, on the station, and he's also been looking over Londo as he recovers from from his injuries. Right. So I think we kind of left that out earlier. Yeah. Uh, once he, once he's recovered, he he's heading back. Um, Bester is leaving, and we've already mentioned that redheaded psychop, uh, who in this case is actually Walter Koenig's wife. Yeah, Judy Levitt. And we get our answer as to whether or not they really were doing unintended or unauthorized scans. Uh, his complaint, why couldn't you have gotten here two minutes sooner? <laughs> so, yeah, he, he wants to dig. Uh, yeah. Bester's not just leaving, though. He's getting the old bums rush off. I mean, he is being escorted off the station right. rapidly. <laughs> exactly. 
you you're 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 right there. They well, they know the drugs are going to be wearing off soon, so that they yeah, want and, him gone. Yeah, yeah, he's being taken away expeditiously, and there's no and and they aren't making <laughs> any uh making any bones about it. He, they want him gone before this uh before the sleeper drug wears off. Yeah. Um speaking of that speaking of drugs. Now we get yeah, we get the real revelation here. This is the wham. Yeah, uh it turns out that dust it might do nasty things to uh teeps, but it was actually created by the Psycor. Yes. For a purpose. They are trying to create telepaths. Mm-hmm. Ouch. And it didn't quite work. It didn't quite work as as they expected. Yeah, and Bester says, you know, we've been working on this for five years. At least we have it back. So, yep. It, does this mean that, uh, this goes back to that shadow technology question, uh, does Morden's activities go back that far? <laughs> um and if so, it, it, it's like it just brings up this whole connection between what are the telepaths doing? What is the connection with shadows? What's the shadows connection with teep? I mean, it, it, it's a lot of stuff going on in the background that we've just seen hints of. Yeah. And for all that turmoil, we, we get a peaceful moment at the end. And I like the yeah. way you write about this. Yeah. Jakar is at peace. Yes. Well, and that is where the episode comes to an that end. That is where the episode ends. It, it was a wonderful episode. We have been talking about this way longer than I expected, actually, looking at the clock. Mm-hmm. And like I said, the whole episode just flew by. When I was watching it, it's like, what? It's over already? Yeah, it was It was a very fast episode, but there's a lot mm-hmm. in there. Indeed. Indeed there is. <sighs> wow. So, any other closing comments? I, I, I know we've talked this thing to death. Yeah. As it is already. Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad to know at this point why Wando behaved the way he did in the first couple of seasons mm-hmm. before he met Mo, uh, Morden and to be reminded of, of Jakar and how Jakar becomes a better person, I guess. Right. That's all great stuff to see. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, this was a very deep character development episode. Yes. So it, 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 it has a lot to do with setting the course for the rest of the series. Mm -hmm. And next up, next up, we have uh, episode number seven from season three, Exogenesis. Right. This is probably one of the closest things to a filler episode we're going to get. It's not one of my favorite episodes. Same here. But we get get a little more. One thing we do get in this episode, the next one is a little more development on uh, Marcus. Yes, and that that's always fun. Yeah. That that's the redeeming aspect of the show. Yeah. Now about this episode. Uh you know, you you mentioned that there was a lot in it, but I seem to notice that there was one thing that was not in it. Oh. No boom. Ah. So there was no boom today? No boom today. Will there be boom tomorrow? Well, will there be boom tomorrow? I just asked that. Well, there's always boom tomorrow. Always boom tomorrow. <laughs> always. Unless you've got something to add, I'm ready to say good night, folks. I'm ready to say good night, folks, myself. Good night, folks. Listen to the nice lady at the end and send us your thoughts as well. Bye bye. Yep. And thank you, Troy Rudder. Amen to that. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yep. Good night. Good night now. Podcast terminated. Thank you for listening to the Babylon Project Podcast. You can email Raul and Jim at the Babylon Project Podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook at the Babylon Project Podcast. 
On the internet, we are at Babylon Project Podcast. Dot wordpress.com to subscribe to the podcast you can find us on iTunes or you can subscribe to the RSS feed on the webpage <laughs>